In the 1920s, Trotsky asked the question, through what stage are we passing? And that question has to be asked and answered in this particular meeting. And in order to understand it, we, we also understand that we cannot explain things in Britain without understanding the, the broad world situation. And that is why we've always traditionally began at the Congress last night, the session on world perspectives. Clearly we're in a period of intense instability on a world scale. And that has arisen from the deep crisis of capitalism, which was ushered in by the crisis of 2008, the deepest crisis that capitalism has faced since the 1930s. And that has resulted in turning everything on its head. That capitalism over the last 12 months has seen a whole series of changes. And they are kind of forewarnings of the stormy period that we have in entered and the events that are going to unfold in the next period. We explained it repeatedly that 2008 marked a qualitative change in the development of world capitalism. It underlined the fact that capitalism had now entered an organic crisis, to use the word, words of uh, Trotsky. A crisis that's inherent to the capitalist system. Characterised by the exhaustion of the capitalist system. That it's reached its limits. And therefore, you could repeat the words of Trotsky, you've entered a protracted death agony of capitalism. Now, Marx explained that as soon as an economic system is incapable of developing the productive forces, and that's the case today on a world scale. They cannot develop the productive forces on the level of the past. We entered a period of decline and a period of deep crisis for the system, which inevitably results in social revolution on the order of the day. And that's the key characteristic of the development of capitalism on a world scale. Even the bourgeois strategists have recognised there's something fundamentally wrong with the capitalist system, but they can't do anything to solve this problem. They've called it uh, secular stagnation. In other words, a, a prolonged period over decades of the stagnation of capitalism. That's their prognosis. And we would confirm that this is a new epoch, an epoch of austerity, an epoch not only of stagnation, but of deep economic uh, crisis affecting the capitalist system. Does that mean to say that there will not be any uh, partial recoveries in one country or another? No, we don't say that. That also is inherent in the situation. You can't have just a continual decline of world capitalism. But that was the characteristics also of the 1930s, where there were also uh, ups and downs in the general shift downwards of world capitalism. You could say that the, da the, the curve of capitalist development, to use Trotsky's phrase, is on a, a downward trajectory. But within that trajectory, there will be ups and downs. But nevertheless, they cannot emerge from this crisis. We have even talked about a permanent crisis. But again, it doesn't mean to say a completely downward turn all the time. But nevertheless, it characterizes a situation where they can't get out of it. Unlike, for instance, in the 1930s, where capitalism was uh, in a depression. And the capitalists could only get out of that depression by the Second World War and the destruction of the productive forces on that basis. Now capitalism, because of the development of nuclear weapons and, and the international class balance of forces, cannot go down the road of world war to solve its problems. It doesn't mean to say there won't be small wars, local wars, which are taking place even at the present time, but a, a world war is ruled out. And therefore they, all the contradictions that are built up in capitalism 
become more exacerbated. All the problems are more internalized. And therefore the period you're entering will be even more damaging for capitalism, even more dangerous for capitalism than the 1930s itself. Uh, even now, the uh, crisis is uh, characterized by massive overproduction on a world scale. Steel has been mentioned many times, but steel, coal, raw materials, cars, houses, everything on a capitalist basis have reached this incredible state of overproduction, the incapacity of capitalism to sell its goods because of a lack of demand, a lack of a market, on a profitable basis. It shows the entire contradictions of capitalism linked up to this present crisis. This year was characterised by the, the Royal Bank of Scotland as a cataclysmic year for capitalism. And I think that is entirely true. That the system is exhausted. The so-called recovery that we've had for the last uh, five years is also completely exhausted. And therefore we are ed on the verge of a new world slump which will be far deeper than, than 2008, which, which in it inevitably will entail a trade war between the different powers and a, and a huge collapse again of the productive forces as we've seen in the 1930s on all the implications that will have for capitalism. Now, uh, we must also say that um, uh, not only can they not get out of this uh, crisis, and they've tried all sorts of means to get out of the crisis. Uh, negative interest rates, which have never been tried before, or a desperate way of attempting to stimulate demand. Um, in Japan, which has uh, experienced something like three decades of a recession, three decades of stagnation, they are now trying, they've tried actually, quantitative easing, the attempt to, to create artificial money to pump into the system. Uh, that hasn't worked. So they're now looking towards quantitative and qualitative easing, QQE. And they even ventured to talk about QQQE when this fails. In other words, it shows the way they're thrashing about trying everything and anything in order to get out of this um, mess, this disastrous situation that they, uh, they, that they exist, that they're in. Uh, but they can't get out of it because of the contradictions of capitalism itself. And there's new contradictions which are emerging all the time. And therefore we can say in a general sense, this is an epoch of revolution and of counter-revolution on a world scale which will affect all the countries of the world to one degree or another. And as a consequence, the bourgeois are very uh, pessimistic about the future. They're quite alarmed about the future and what it holds. Because they can see for the first time that not only a deep economic crisis, but it's now been reflected in the consciousness of the masses of the population. This anti-capitalist mood that is developing on a world scale is a product of the crisis and the attacks of the crisis. There can be no recovery, if you like. There certainly can be no upswing as we had following the Second World War. That's ruled out. That the reforms they were able to grant are ruled out. Now it's a period of counter-reforms are on the agenda. And that stems from the crisis of capitalism itself. But this uh, transformation of consciousness doesn't take place in a straight line, doesn't take place gradually, it takes place in a very dialectical way where quantity changes into quality. And uh, it, it, that consciousness takes place or changes in leaps and bounds uh, in a big bang. And that's what's taking place at the present time, particularly in the United States, but graphically with the emergence of, this, uh, of the Trump phenomena and also of the uh, Bernie Sanders phenomena. 
of a, a colossal hatred of the establishment, a hatred of, uh, of the rich, of the 1%, and the need to look for a radical way out from their problems. And why Sanders has uh, appeared to millions uh, of calling for a political revolution to overthrow the billionaire class. A very revolutionary slogan to be used, which is radicalizing, affecting millions in the United States, who are yearning for fundamental change. The uh, American dream is no longer. It's more like an American nightmare for large layers of the working class. There was one uh, article that appeared in the Financial Times which uh, summed up the kind of mood of the capitalists on a world scale. It was called Warnings of the 1930s. It was from the Financial Times of the 14th of March, just a few weeks ago. Western democracy is going through an acute stress test. On both sides of the Atlantic, people have lost faith in their public institutions. We can no longer be sure the centre will hold. The most insidious trend is vanishing optimism about the future. Many have since had their homes repossessed. Medium incomes were lower in 2015 than in 2005. The majority on both sides of the Atlantic believe their children would be worse off than they are. Labour's share of national income keeps plummeting. Despite the US economy's recovery, 2015 saw the sharpest rise in US wage inequality since the end of the Great Recession. More Americans are living in poverty than at any time since records began more than 50 years ago. The final, final echo of the 1930s is the declining global order. I think this uh, quote sums up the enormous pessimism the bourgeois have in their own system and how it's creating a revolutionary mood in society, challenging the capitalist system in all countries itself. Today's Financial Times has an article about Iceland where the comrades have seen the demonstrations in Iceland had overthrown the Prime Minister and are threatening to overthrow the government. And it quotes a demonstrator, there are two nations in this country, the ones who own everything and the rest of us. Another said, we are sick of it. It's just not change of government we want, it's a change of the system. Which again reflects the real mood that exists. Another, another commentator said, I always felt the revolution was not finished. Now it's, it, it feels like we are finishing the revolution. Again, the, the mood that exists, even in Iceland, is, a, is an indication of the, of the changed consciousness affecting broad layers in America and also in Europe. Again, I come across a, a, a quote from the Financial Times about France. And it asks the question, is France on the brink of a revolution? Is, is, is President Hollande in danger of being dragged to the guillotine? These sound like silly questions. In fact, they are silly questions. Yet, talk of a revolution, of a new revolution, is surprisingly common in France these days. Now, these bourgeois commentators are clearly um, trying to find out the mood as a warning to the ruling class. You had even the commentator from um, Donald Tusk, not a commentator, the head of the European Commission. You say that Europe is facing a potential 1968 scenario. And what he meant by that was in France in 1968, it was a month-long, six-week general strike of 10 million workers. And that the conditions in Europe are being replicated. A profound unease, a profound hostility to big business, to capitalism, and so on and so forth. And that's the general characteristic 
of the world situation. A whole series of revolutionary explosions are on the order of the day. Capitalism is creating these, this, this, these conditions. As, as it gets worse, as it attacks the working class, as it says there's no future for young people, then they react obviously in a very radical way in attempting to seek a way out of this situation of permanent austerity, of no future, which is uh, the situation at the present time. And therefore our starting point for any analysis about Britain or the world is that there's no way out on the basis of capitalism for the working class. There's no way out. And therefore, there has to be a, a move in the direction of revolution, as there was in the 1920s and in the 1930s in the next period. And this is the background to what we are having or what we're facing in Britain. And Britain has uh, experienced quite a profound change over the last 12 months. But if you're looking at Britain, we should also analyse it from a, a long-term point of view and see how things are, are moving. We have the special crisis of British capitalism, which Ted Grant analysed adequately in his writings, which said that Britain has been in decline for the past 100 years. But this decline has been accelerated, particularly over the last 30 or so years, and is reflected in the inability of the, of the ruling class in Britain to modernise and develop industry in Britain. They've failed to invest, they've failed to develop the productive forces in Britain in order to compete on a world scale. And therefore they've fallen further and further and further behind their competitors on a world scale. Further than behind them, all the European powers. And this, is, this decline has reflected itself in a chronic deindustrialization of Britain. Over the last 30 years, manufacturing industry has declined by two thirds. It's a massive deindustrialization, far bigger than any other major industrial power in the world. In terms of steel, which is obviously the bedrock of a modern industrial economy. Steel is the foundation, so it's the basis of the Industrial Revolution. We see the way the steel industry has collapsed in Britain and is now a threat of it being wiped out altogether. In the 19th century, Britain had 40% of the world's production of steel. Now it's got 0.7% of world production. It's collapsing because of the massive overproduction arising from, from China and elsewhere. They cannot sell this amount. And therefore we've seen in terms of steel, in terms of metals, in terms of, terms of chemicals, which is the basis of industrial production, Britain has faced the biggest fall in any country of the world. So that gives you an indication of the, of the decline of British capitalism over the past period. Because the working class are suffering because of that. Whole industries have been wiped out, coal industry, steel going, shipbuilding, all, of, all the basic industries have been undermined because of the capitalist class's refusal in Britain to invest. They prefer to invest abroad. They prefer to invest in speculation and property speculation, in antiques, in gold, in anything, but in manufacturing, in industry, and, and, and so on. In fact, uh, they are, they are caught up with a mania, as Marx uh, once said, of an attempt to make money out of money without going through the, the process of production. And that's why we see the consequences of, this, uh, of British capitalism's foundations, which are, are, uh, are, uh, are uh, crumbling, really, and have crumbled in the past uh, period. Now the threat of 40,000 job losses in the steel industry if Talbot goes and other industries and other, other uh, steel plants go. You see, uh, and they're all owned by foreign uh, corporations. This, uh, once the workshop of the world has been taken over, companies have been taken over even by Indian companies, which is quite ironic. And even now an Indian uh, billionaire is talking about uh, intervening to buy the remnants of the steel industry, but on one condition, or two conditions. First of all, state aid, 
massive amount of state aid, and secondly, the workers in those industries take a, a reduction in wages and conditions. In fact, the, the discussions going on in Scunthorpe, we've got a comedy here from Scunthorpe, there's a ballot taking place in Scunthorpe of the workers, and now for them to take lower wages, lower conditions, in order to keep their jobs. In other words, they've been blackmailed into this kind of position. And this is how British capitalism has developed over the past period. As a consequence, we've got the biggest balance of payment crisis in history since records began in 1948. A hundred billion pounds worth of deficit because of an inability to compete on a world scale. Seven percent of gross domestic product has to be covered by borrowing from abroad in order for us to survive because of the decline of British industry and the decline of British capitalism in the past, in the past period. This, uh, we've seen the recent figures, I think they were out yesterday. Uh, industrial production continues to fall. It fell by, in February by 0.5%. Manufacturing industry fell by 1.8% over the last year. I mean, these are disastrous figures when they're supposed to be rebalancing the economy because, the, because of the basis of, um, of banking, financial services, which become far, far more dominant in the British economy than at any time before. In fact, the city of London is booming, while the industrial areas are suffering enormously, are in decline. And that reflects the topsy-turvy nature of British capitalism. We've destroyed industry and boosted banking and, and boosted financial services and other speculative aspects, if you like, of capitalism itself. And uh, the London, far from being uh, 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 just for Britain, it's become an international centre of finance capital. It's going to be an international centre of parasitic capitalism, if you like. Um, it... it um, it go, what goes through, through uh, uh, the city of London is equivalent, I think, of 70% of all bonds created, traded on the world stock markets go through London. 70%. In relation to, to derivatives, 40% of the world's der derivatives uh, go through the, 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 the London stock exchanges. Shows how dominant how super dominant this sector is in Britain at the present uh, moment. On a, on a daily basis, the city of London has a turnover of 1.4 trillion pounds on a daily basis. At the same time, you can see the parasitic, this illustrates far more than anything else, the parasitic nature of British capitalism and the failure of the British capitalists uh, it's their responsibility for this huge decline that we've experienced, we've experienced, which is going to have major effects on the living standards of workers, of young people and so on, has had and will have in the future. Of course, um, we've seen uh, what it's, what's uh, being created here. In fact, they talk about uh, the City of London and so on, the financial service, the banking, as a, a kind of strength to the British economy. But it's the weakness, it shows a weakness of the British economy. And that's why Britain was hard hit in 2008. It suffered a bigger decline 2008-2009 than Britain had in 1929 to 1931. Bigger than the Depression. Again, mainly because of the reliance on service and on banking industry. But this uh, collapse has meant also the, the rise of a, of a low-skilled, low-waged economy. As, compares, as compared to the past. The British workers have suffered the greatest flexibility of labour, possibly uh, next to the United States of America, where conditions have been continually ground down, where wages have been forced down, where terms and conditions have been ripped up over the past period. Agency work, which is the epitome of flexible working, You've got more agency workers in Britain than the whole of Europe combined. That's the position. It shows that the nature of work in Britain now is transformed. And uh, what does it mean? It means enormous stress on the working class. 
who has been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed at every single turn. And that squeeze is not finishing by any uh, shape or form. And you look at the areas. I saw a, a figure by, uh, produced by uh, Eurostat recently, which said that the gross domestic product per individual, per person, in West Wales is lower than Poland. It also pointed out that in Teesside and in Durham, you have a lower GDP per head than in the Czech Republic. That's how things have developed in many areas of Britain at the, at, the, at the present time, lower than the standards in Eastern Europe, which are also very low compared to, to Western Europe. On top of that, we've had six years of austerity, biting austerity, which also has reduced living standards. The biggest fall in real wages for 150 years has taken place in Britain. So therefore, this has a big impact on, on the way people begin to, to uh, assess the situation, assess their lives and so on. Of course, this, uh, the capitalists are not satisfied with this. They want a race to the bottom. And that's no accident why um, Jeremy Hunt, for instance, who is well in the news at this point in time, has said that the British workers need to take a leaf out of the, out of the workers in China. They should uh, work as hard as the workers in China and probably uh, live on the same wages as the workers in China. That's the real future that the British workers have under capitalism in Britain. In other words, there's a continual downward spiral of living standards and conditions. And other factors, homelessness in London. Over the last two years, homelessness has grown by 38%. You've got uh, cases of tuberculosis uh, affecting large uh, uh, parts and cities of, of, of England and Wales. In London, I was surprised to see that in, in, the, in the boroughs of Brent and in Newham, they've got levels of TB on the same par as Iraq and Algeria. Now that says it all. Uh, Britain has been, has been re if like, reduced to a third, third world country in many respects which shows the devastating crisis of British capitalism and what it means. Of course, they've, uh, they've risen the minimum wage, so therefore all workers are cheering to their rafters. Quite clearly, first of all, not everybody will get it, that's quite clear. There will be employers who will get round it, and the way they do it in many, many ways, by increasing the workload, if they have to pay it, they'll make it work damn harder for it, or they'll make people redundant. In other words, you have to do the same work in the same hours, or more work in the same hours, uh, rather. And therefore, this will also be eaten away. We've got council tax rises, rent rises, uh, prescription charge increases. We've got uh, increases through services who've been cut by the Tory government. All those will eat into the living standards of the working class and reduce the living standards over the next period. And this has resulted in frustration, anger, bitterness in British society. And the deeper you go into the working class, the more angrier, the more bitter, and the more great is the discontent. And that's what we have to understand what's taking place in Britain. Of course, the, uh, the trade union leaders, instead of um, basing themselves on this anger, basing themselves on this frustration, to lead a battle against the Tory government and a battle against the employers, have capitulated. They are, they are the most, uh, Trotsky said that in, in the 1920s that the British trade union leaders were the most conservative force in history, in society rather. And he's absolutely right. They're a break on the movement, the barrier to the struggles of the working class. Uh, and that's why you've had a relatively low level of strikes in the past period. However, um, you know, they're, 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 they're the workers are being squeezed. Like in the steel industry. But what has community done, this, this great uh, trade union leaders? They've even come out against the idea of nationalisation. They want a cosy relationship with the employers, they said, like they've had for the last 35 years. That's what they've been talking about. They're prepared to accept the cuts. They're prepared to accept the reductions in order to keep the jobs. The same old argument that they've used uh, time, time in and time out. Uh, but the working class is still, has the, is, is, is not, is, its anger is not going away, it's getting, getting worse, it's getting more and more. And it's like a pressure cooker, if you keep it 
sealed all the time. It just keeps building up and building up. There's no safety valve here. And it's a very explosive position in the British working class, as is the case in, working, in the working class in other countries. And without this safety, safety valve, it means there's going to be one hell of an explosion when it comes. And it's quite a paradox that the people who are on strike now, the junior doctors, you know, even the BAA is not even affiliated to the TUC. But it's a young layer, a fresh layer, which was always a privileged layer in the past, quite clearly. But because of the, uh, the actions of the government in trying to proletarianize this layer, the forced down conditions, they've reacted in a very militant fashion. And that's a, a reflection also of the, the youthfulness of this, of this layer, obviously. They don't, haven't got the hang-ups of the past on their shoulders. And that's why they've, they've taken this action, which is, which is, uh, which is uh, a very important symptom of the situation. I think the teachers have also threatened to go on strike as well over this question of academies being introduced. Again, a symptom of the, of the situation. But the, generally, the trade unions are holding the situation back. Just like in, in, in uh, Grangemouth, a few years back, back, where they had an enormous possibility of making a victory out of that dispute, a, a petrochemical plant that could take action which would, which would paralyze the whole of the economy. What power, more power do you want? And all you had was uh, McCluskey running up to uh, uh, Glasgow saying, uh, this is a scandal. You know, um, we should be uh, discussing this issue for its ruined industrial relations, he said. And that was the kind of outlook of the trade union leaders. In fact, I just saw a speech by McCluskey the other day. about uh, Jim sent it to me about uh, the EU. And I was saying, well, we have to stay in the EU despite all the problems. And it means, yes, we have to, to vote uh, yes together with uh, uh, Cameron, despite that Cameron's the most anti-working class leader, we still have to vote with them. Why? Because we have to be statesmanlike. That's the, the quote, we've got to be statesmanlike. This is, this is a, indicates the kind of rottenness you have at the tops of the trade union movement at the present time. Of course, they can be on the basis of a wave, they either ride the wave or they will be thrown, out, thrown by the wayside. And therefore, we, we shouldn't rule out this, uh, this, this, this growing discontent can reflect itself on the, industrial, on the industrial field. However, you could say that this uh, mood in, in society, if it's not going to reflect itself in an industrial struggle, certainly reflects itself in a political radicalization that's taking place at the present time. An anti-establishment feeling, an anti-big business feeling, you know, them and us kind of feeling, which exists everywhere in, in Britain. And that's, uh, that, that's not going to go away, that's going to deepen in the next uh, period. Um, of course, this, this anger, this bitterness, this frustration has been reflected, as we've seen, first of all, in, in the referendum in Scotland. That was an indication of uh, a huge change in the consciousness of the people in Scotland. Of, uh, against austerity, against capitalism, as the re 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 represented, and uh, rep caused a fundamental change in Scotland, resulting in the collapse of the, of, the, of the Labour Party, which was a dominant party in Scotland, who were completely collapsed in the, in the general election that followed in May of, of last year. I mean, they reduced to one seat. Why? Because the SNP put on a left face. And the Labour Party paid for years and decades of betrayal of the Scottish workers. Enough was enough, they said. And that's why they, were, they failed this time to support the Labour Party in Scotland, particularly under Jim Murphy and, those, uh, and the right-wing Blairites who, who, who led the party into the, into the general election. But this uh, radicalisation also will not uh, go away. In Scotland also, it's worth pointing out, it was said yesterday, that Labour will not recover very easily in Scotland. There's been a fundamental change here. And even over the um, this, uh, elections now, the Holyrood elections in Scotland, Labour is 30 points behind the SNP. That's the gap, 30 points. In fact, the, the discussion in Scotland is whether Labour will be pushed into third place behind the Tories. Can you imagine it? It's an incredible uh, position. 
And uh, even with the PR representatives we've got there, the SNP are going to win a landslide there. Again, coming out on the left, left reformist uh, kind of uh, approach. It's going to take a, a, a while for any changes on that uh, front because the, the national question uh, as well. But this uh, surge that we saw in Scotland was missing in England and Wales. The mood was there, but it didn't have any, uh, anything to connect with. And uh, clearly, uh, although the mood represented in, in, in the last election certain changes, for instance, the, the growth of UKIP, although it's a right-wing party, nevertheless, it's seen as an anti-establishment party. And it garnered something in nearly four million votes. The Greens took nearly a million votes in that election. The Labour Party, on the contrary, although its vote went up by 1%, that is, that is true, the Tories' vote only went up by 1%. There was a large amount of abstentions that took place. But Labour couldn't capitalise on the previous five years of austerity government. They couldn't capitalise on it because they were offering austerity light. They were offering much of the same. And therefore, how could that enthuse anybody? How could that generate a, a colossal interest where there was no, nothing, nothing to choose fundamentally as, as people saw it? And therefore, there was a... Therefore, the Tories were able to get back to power. For well, the first time since 92, they have a majority. They didn't win the election. They were handed it to them on the plate by the Labour Party and the Labour leaders, who had sold the workers down the, down the road from that point of view. And uh, the victory of the Tory party, nevertheless, was not a, a huge success for the ruling class, that the Tories were a, got a majority what, of 12 very, very small majority. Compare that to Margaret Thatcher in, what, 1983. 144 majority for the Tories. That's a wampy majority. That's a strong government to take on the working class, which it did. But a government, you know, of, uh, of 12, when there's uh, splits and divisions open up, it is very, very weak altogether. All and we've seen that in the past period. Uh, soon after the election, they would talk about cuts in benefits. And uh, that had a reaction. And I think the, the comrades saw it on uh, this uh, the single mother on Newsnight, who voted Tory in the general election. When she heard that she was due for a benefit cut, she attacked the Tories. And remember the, the person on, on the platform? Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. And that had a big effect on those people uh, looking at it. It, it, kind of, it kind of had a, an impact on, on those layers who are now becoming affected and attacked by the, by the Tories in an outward way. Of course, um, uh, Osborne shrugged it off and in, in, in December of last year talked about uh, uh, that everything was going fine. That uh, the, the uh, organisation of budgetary responsibility have told them that growth was going to continue, tax was going to go up, and they were on, on, on par, they were on line to achieving a budget surplus by 2019, 2020. And he was boasting about the position of British capitalism and the position of the Tory government. But when, within one month, he was singing a different tune. He was talking about a, co a, a toxic cocktail of events that are facing British capitalism. He was mainly talking about the world economy, but also in Britain, as we can see with the balance of payments crisis, and then very shortly was informed that the black hole in British, uh, uh, the British budget was 18 billion pounds. And the only way they could uh, make up on that was further austerity, deeper austerity, and deeper cuts to, uh, the, to the livelihoods of working people. And that's what they tried to, to, to embark upon. The only thing is, the Tory government now is in, a, in extreme difficulties. It's like a perfect storm. You know, the economy has gone belly up. There's a huge slowdown in the British economy. Obviously, taxes are not being uh, raised. The deficit is getting larger. They have to get, uh, borrow more uh, money. So they're in grave difficulties, and they want to carry out further attacks and further cuts. But the Cameron's opened up a gang of worms now in relation to Europe. Europe has uh, paralyzed the government. And the question of the European referendum 
was a means by saving the skin of Cameron and hopefully, hoping to win a majority government by undermining support for UKIP. It was a political ploy, which is not in the interest of British capitalism to create this colossal uncertainty which exists at the present time. And uh, certainly it's opened up what might, must be described as a bloody civil war within the Tory party. I mean, the, the question of, uh, of uh, Europe was always uh, a kind of uh, fractured line within the Tory party, always. It's led to the removal of leaders, created the biggest crisis in the Tory party in the past. And they thought in some way they could overcome that crisis. They will get by, they'll sort it out. But it's come back with a vengeance. And now, of course, you had the resignation of Ian Duncan Smith, you know, on the basis of all, oh, he did look at all these cuts, I'm against these cuts. In the last five, six years, he's been carrying through the cuts. 30 billions worth of cuts in relation to the uh, uh, bedroom tax alone. And of course, he's on television in tears. He was crying because he felt sorry for the poor. Even Boris Johnson was in tears. The blubberer Johnson, he was, oh, the steel workers. I feel so sad for them, he said. I feel my heart for bleeds for them. The only reason why he said that, because he used the, the issue to stick the knife into camera and more in relation to the European uh, question. So the whole thing's unraveling. Now we've got the, the Panama business, the steel strike. And the Panama business is very serious. It undermines the authority, the moral authority of the government and Cameron in particular. And how far is this prepared to go? We don't know. And scandals and corruption is, a very, is endemic in the capitalist system and pops up in the, precisely in periods of crisis. Look at Spain at the present time, the popular, popular party, they're up to their eyeballs in corruption, so is the monarchy. In fact, they've now declared a new election, the 23rd of June, they have a new general election because there's no government in Spain. There's no government in Ireland. It shows the, the complete instability of capitalism and that instability is, is affecting British capitalism and the British government itself. It's all show on the top. In reality, the knives are out. A, and they terrified. I think it was Liam Fox who was on the television a few days ago saying, I don't know whether we'll be able to put it back together. Hope the people, hope, hope our leaders will stop attacking, them, attacking themselves in this particular way, in the most vindictive manner. And the reason, they're terrified of what's going to happen. Is Britain going to leave the, U, the EU? I don't, do, I don't know. It's on the life edge, the way things are looking. But if, 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 uh, if they do leave, Cameron will be forced to resign. There'll be an absolute upheaval in, in, in Britain. Um, there'll be, again, continued warfare in the Tory party. If they don't leave Europe, there'll be deeper divisions in the Tory party. Vengeance against those who didn't uh, call for an outvote. The whole party can disintegrate, as a matter of fact. It seems very calm, you know, this, this party has, happened, has been in existence for hundreds of years. But it's a, we've seen everywhere else. The, boo, the crisis of capitalism means a crisis of the bourgeois parties. The crisis of all parties, as a matter of fact. And they could split. And if they split and, and move to the right, the right wing split, which is entirely possible under these circumstances, you can have the creation of a party similar to the National Front in France. They have a kind of Bonapartist party, a right-wing, nationalistic, Bonapartist, pro-monarchist party. It would absorb UKIP and be a very uh, pernicious force on the right of British politics. And it would be, if like, the embryo of a future movement towards fascism, if that was, it, that was the case. A very reactionary party. And this is the possibilities we're in. The crisis of British capitalism, a, fra a fracture within the Tory party. Whatever happens, they're going to be in the doldrums. They're going to be losing support. They're going to be hemorrhaging support in the next period because they have to carry through further cuts. And they're not able to do it in such a way. They're going to be split. There's going to be huge divisions. Johnson's going to try and go for the leadership. Others will be jockeying for leadership position. The whole nightmare scenario is opened up. And this is just the beginning because there'll be further problems as far as the government is concerned in the next period. So there we have a, a split that could be... Could be could develop within a period of sharp and sudden changes, as Ted explained. And therefore, a split in the, in the Tory party could easily happen at lightning speed. Of course, um, there's volatility also, if you go back a bit, bit, bit further, bit, has taken place 
has affected also the city we in, in Britain with the election of Corbyn as the leader of the Labour Party. And this came from nowhere. It was an accident born out of the necessity of the situation to get some form of expression for this radicalised mood in society. The right wing had blundered. The right wing had made the biggest mistake of their lives in allowing Corbyn on the ballot paper, on the one hand, secondly, lending him their votes or their nominations on the other hand, and thirdly, opening up the process to uh, the, the general public on the payment of three pounds, they could participate in the election of the Labour leader. What an absolute blunder they made. And uh, as a consequence of this blunder, the whole thing began to unravel. Where we had this move in reflection, the Labour Party membership at that stage was about 200,000. By the time you added all those people who joined or registered in different forms and ways, it had gone up to 600,000 or over that. Of course, they wheedled a few people out, including a few comrades, as far as the voting was concerned. But nevertheless, you will see that Corbyn's simple anti-austerity message was hitting home, as opposed to the Blairites. And therefore, he got 60% of the vote on the first ballot. And poor old Liz Kendall, the Blairite, got 4%, or 4.5%. It was a devastating blow to the right wing. When Corbyn went into the room to be told the result, the Labour Party officials there were part of the right wing. They told him what the result were. They looked as if they were telling him that his father had died. It was like they were going to a funeral. They were looking at their boots and everything, you know. They were, and that's the, they were demoralised that this thing had happened overnight. And the ruling class also were drawing those conclusions. By Christ's sake, we've lost the Labour Party. We've lost control of the Labour Party. That's unheard of. And they said as an editorial in the Financial Times, what's going on? This is not Podemos. This is not Syriza. This is the Labour Party that's been in existence for over 100 years. And they had prime ministers and governments. And the Labour Party was a very important weapon, a tool by the ruling class to create stability and to keep the working class in check using the Labour leaders, of course, to carry out that message. And for them to lose political control of the Labour Party was a devastating setback for the ruling class. Of course, uh, things got worse for them. MacDonald immediately appointed, sorry, uh, Corbyn immediately appointed John MacDonald as the shadow chancellor, which sent off the alarm bells even further. Only thing is that the right wing obviously controlled the parliamentary Labour Party. The parliament, the, all the MPs were left over from the past. Out of the 200, well, 230 odd, only what 17 supported him, and probably less than that, really. Uh, it shows the balance of forces within the parliamentary Labour Party. Overwhelmingly Blairite, overwhelmingly right wing dominated. And uh, they, as we know, elements in, within those, 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 the, the PLP said they better stage an immediate coup to get rid of Corbyn. But they had to backtrack on that because they knew that, that they had won such a landslide victory, they couldn't move in that direction immediately. So, and, so they tried to, uh, to undermine him at every single stage, denouncing him, attacking him in the press, in the media, even when they elected a new shadow cabinet. Even the shadow cabinet members were undermining and attacking Corbyn. In the, in the PLP meetings, it was like a bear pit where they were attacking Corbyn and, and his supporters. The whole thing was extremely hostile. And uh, that is the character of what's happening in the tops of the Labour Party. It's a civil war. Let's not get about it. It's a civil war in the Labour Party. And particularly at the top where the, the knives are out to stab Corbyn in the back if they can get away with it. Of course, he even brought into the press question of Trident emerged. And then generals were appearing on the, on the television saying that they couldn't work with the Labour government if they go down this road of reducing arms expenditure and decommissioning Trident is a threat of a coup. And of course, there's no threat of an immediate military coup in Britain. But that's the music of the future, when parliamentary democracy will not deliver the results for the ruling class. They will turn towards a military solution. But they'll have to think a thousand times, because that will stoke up civil war in Britain as well. 
But it just shows how the, the ruling class will use this auxiliary weapon and other auxiliary weapons to protect its own interests. Then we had this, the, the vote on, on uh, the bombing of, of Syria, where um, he was being pre Corbyn was pressurised to, to provide a, a free vote. And uh, on the basis of that free vote and the pressure that was being exerted from below, maybe through momentum, which had to be created, Corbyn had to create some balance, some forces that would help him uh, beat the right wing, which put pressures on M MPs around the country. But even then, 66 right wing Labour MPs voted with the Tories in order to, 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 to get the measures through for the bombing of Syria, when 70% of Labour Party members were absolutely opposed to the bombing. Shows how out of touch these people are. And then you had Hillary Benn, who uh, was seated next to Corbyn as his uh, shadow foreign secretary, who then got up and made a speech attacking uh, Corbyn, attacking the leader, and making, a, making an impassioned plea for support to bomb Syria. And had a standing ovation, clapping and standing ovation in the House of Commons, which is unheard of. Again, it's an indication of, of the right, if you like, the, the real position in the parliamentary party and, and these right-wing rogues who have no different from the Tories and the Liberals, what's left of them. And that's why we have to understand that there's a, a class divide within the Labour Party at the pro present moment. We have to understand that, well, in the words of uh, Lord Mansel Mandelson, there are two Labour parties, absolutely right. And in the words of um, Frank Field, that anybody challenged through deselection should stand against the Labour Party and have the backing of, of all right-wing members of the Labour Party. In other words, split the Labour Party vote. That's what he's proposing. He wasn't disciplined, of course, or anything like that. But that's these, these, these are the, the real rogues who are only interested in their careers and interested in maintaining capitalism. And therefore, the, the question of a split in the Labour Party is inherent in the situation itself. Of course, how this, is, uh, how this opens up is another matter. But clearly, um, the ruling class has a kind of choice before itself, a very difficult choice. On the one hand, it looks at the Labour leaders and it weighs them up. And of course, you can see that Macdonald now has gone far to the right. You know, uh, Macdonald said, oh, he was in favour of, uh, of Marx and uh, reading Capital and so on a few years ago because of the 2008 crisis. Now he's talking about, well, we want to work, we want to have capitalism to work for us. Capitalism has got to be made to uh, bring us a bit more e equality. We've got to make it different. We've got to have a human face and so on and so forth. We've got to use Keynesianism. And he's got this circle of economists, of Piketty and and uh, Stiglitz and other people like that of, of, of Keynesians to dictate the, or decide the policy of the Labour Party, of Keynesianism. That's all they got to offer. Although it's true they have come through forward with the renationalisation of the railways, or very, very popular, although that will take a long time on the basis of what, how they propose. It is true that, uh, Cam, um, that Corbyn Corp came forward and said we should nationalise the steel industry. Although the Labour Party has now retreated on that, it's short to nationalisation to find a buyer. And uh, Macdonald have said basically he's prepared to balance the books as well. We've got to be careful on spending. I'll be hard on spending, he said. You know, you can rely on me, you can trust in me. And he's obviously uh, talking to the City of London to get some credibility. And so, they, so they really understand that these individual left reformists who base themselves on capitalism would bend. That they are precious. They know that. They can look elsewhere. The problem for them is what lies behind the left reformist leaders. That's what the ruling class is terrified of. The class balance of forces, the enormous pressures that would be unleashed if you had a left Labour government in the trade unions and the working class. All this, this pressure cooker that we're under would, would, could explode on the basis of that and then they would not know exactly where things would go. That is the danger they've got. So they have a, have a problem. So what could they do? Well, they could allow a Labour government to come to power. That's a possibility. 
Um, there will be boundary changes, it is true, and uh, there will be a number of deselections taking place. So there will be more civil war in the Labour Party, that is true. But the, the, Labour, the, the Tories are going to be completely discredited in the, in the next period. And therefore the Labour is likely to get back to power, with the help probably of the SNP. The SNP will have a, a big uh, contingent, they'll support a, a minor, minority Labour government. But that'll be a government of crisis, clearly. We enter a, a deep capitalist crisis, it will be a government of crisis and under pressure from the ruling class to do the dirty. And we saw what happened in Greece, where uh, um, Syriza was elected an anti-austerity program and capitulated and carried out a betrayal of the working class in Greece. And that could be the fate of, of a, a crisis Labour government. If you're not prepared to overthrow capitalism, you have to carry out the dictates of capitalism. There's no other way th uh, for it. So they could choose that as, as an option. Or the other option would be, why not split the Labour Party? That's another, that's an easy thing to do. The right wing is prepared to go any time. And with the full backing of the ruling class, all the media, the press and everything else, You'd have the, you could have the formation of a, another SDP kind of formation. Uh, but you could, with, with the split in the Tory party, you could have the, right, the, the so-called progressive wing of the Tories, the left Tories, so to speak, could link over, up with the Blairites to form this centre kind of party, as they would call it. And they could form a national government under those circumstances. Uh, in 1931, the... Uh, you know, there was no way out for capitalism. They needed a strong government, not a weak one. It's no good. And therefore, a, a national government would fill the bill, as far as that's concerned. The only danger with a national government and splitting the Labour Party is the, Labour, the right wing will go over to, to a national government and carry out big cuts and be equally as unpopular as the Tories were before. And on its left, you have a radicalised, new, revived Labour Party on an anti-austerity basis moving to the left under the pressure of events. And eventually that national government will, will also collapse. And you could have the, uh, the, the election of a new left Labour government. And what would that left Labour government be, by the way? It would be a government again of crisis. I mean, Trotsky talked about a Kerensky-type government. Uh, taking place, uh, developing in Britain in the 1920s, early 30s. That, and the, a, a Kerensky government in 1917 in Russia, you know, it lasted nine months before the revolution. Obviously, a, a Kerensky type government in Britain would last a lot longer, It'd be far more protracted, that's quite clear. But it's the, it's the break on the revolution you're talking about then. Because a, 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 a victory of a Labour government, a left Labour government, under those circumstances, could provoke a pre-revolutionary crisis in Britain. Or the election of a national government could do the same. That's what Trotsky explained in 1931. A national government came, came to power and Britain was characterised as a, a pre-revolutionary period. Opened up to the ideas and that was reflected in the ILP, splitting away from the Labour Party as a centrist formation. And the, this is the times we're entering, ones of splits, of divisions, of, of a turmoil in po of politics. Nothing will hold together. Creating more revolutionary waves in society, in one form or another. Consciousness being in, uh, risen uh, much more than in the past. And that's the kind of the situation that we're entering. Huge class, clashes on, on the scenes, class battles. And with that, obviously, the possibility, our tendency, making a huge gains under those circumstances. You know, if we grew to, to a force of a thousand under objective conditions like that, when at the right place, at the right time, with the right ideas, you can go to 10,000 or more. I mean, in the, in the heat of the Spanish Revolution, in 1936, the centrist organization of the PUM, on the basis of the lightning heat of the revolution, grew from 1,000 the 60,000 in the space of six weeks. But that showed the, 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 the way in which events can unfold. And therefore we have to understand what's, a, what's at stake and our responsibilities in that outcome. Because the, the, the problem we've got is a lack of a subjective factor in Britain. Without that factor being developed, the revolution will not succeed. As Ted explained, the subjective factor is the most important factor in history. And we are building it. We're the only ones who can build it. 
But it means that we have time against us. We have to raise the, the level of consciousness of our own comrades to build the tendency, to build the organization. And that in, at the funda fundamentally means mainly open youth work, which can be linked to trade union work and the radicalization of the working class itself. For every one we can win now and train and educate, we can win a hundred in the future. That's the way we have to, to look at things. You know, we always um, quote Karl Marx and, uh, and Alan always quotes, and he will quote tomorrow from the Bible. But I like to quote uh, John Wayne. <laughs> when he was at the Alamo and they were surrounded, he said, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And comrades, we've got to get going. It's going to be tough out there, but we can do it. Let's make it.